Live from Case at 12. The six o'clock news starts right now. Another afternoon with rounds of good soaking rain in San Antonio. Yeah, it's affecting our roadways as well. But before we get to that, let's go to meteorologist Adam Kasky for the latest on our forecast tonight. Adam. Yeah, and Myra, I love how you said good soaking rain because that's what this is. Good soaking shower activity, a little bit of lightning and thunder associated with it. We've had some showers and storms pop up with a little bit of small hail, but nothing severe, nothing damaging, just scattered showers popping up across some drought stricken parts of our area and some not drought stricken parts, not drought stricken here. Gonzales to Carn City to Yorktown to Quero, Hallettsville. This is good maintenance rain that we have maintaining our lack of drought, but some heavy rain and I'm not going to put any storm tracks on these because really these are just developing in place, barely drifting and then raining themselves out. But it's good soaking rainfall, but be careful, especially on the rural roads. You know, you're fairly saturated and in the lower areas you could easily have some pond of water and even some uh, localized spots where it's a little bit too high. You don't want to be driving through it. Locally around San Antonio, uh, we just have the light lingering rain. Not bad, moderate in nature as you get farther to the northeast side of town, especially up I-35, 1604 between 10 and 35. And this is a zone where we really had the heaviest rainfall earlier this afternoon. Check out some of these rainfall totals that we picked up. And this yellow, that indicates a minimum of two inches of rain. So right there through Selma, Shirts, Live Oak, right along I-35, we had over two inches estimated by the Doppler radar, 2.3, right near the racetrack there, 2.2 inches. And notice, even as you get down within 410, significant rainfall totals of an inch to two inches along I-35. And we're going to have more about how much rain fell and where, talk about how long these showers are going to last, and compare it to the aquifer and how much the various aquifer zones got in just a bit. All right, we'll see you then, Adam. Thanks. We mentioned this rain affecting traffic right now. Let's show you how here at I-35 in Walls. And look at all that water that is collected there on the access road, merging traffic. It's definitely a little dicey. As you can see, there is one vehicle that looks like it is stalled in this water, the main lanes of I-35. Of course, the timing of this not great with the six o'clock commute, but certainly something to be aware of in those low lying areas. We are seeing a lot of uh, ponding of water on the roads. On top of any lingering physical effects, many are still feeling the financial fallout of COVID-19. They may have lost their jobs or had a lot more expenses to worry about. Jesse Degollado says as of last year, there's been a federal COVID grant helping people in those tough predicaments. Like many at the Bear County Tax Assessor Collector's Office, Dora Veal had come to make a payment on her back taxes. And the girl told me, you don't know nothing. They already paid it for you. What? And when she tried to pay part of her past due utility bill. What? What do you mean I don't know nothing? Yeah. The chance Veal took had paid off. Why not try it? Why not try and see if they help me? Veal had applied for half the Housing Assistance Fund, a nearly $55 million federal grant that so far has helped over 5,400 people impacted by COVID-19 as of January 2020. It can help pay past due mortgage payments, property taxes, or utility bills. Thanks to God that he they helped me, and I'm so grateful. The best part, says Bear County Tax Assessor Collector Albert Ureste. This is a grant, so it does not have to be uh, repaid. Almost as good, the staff at his office helped her with the online application. Couldn't have done it by myself because I don't know how to even turn a computer on. <laughs> the Bear County Tax Assessor Collector says his office is the only one in the state administering the Housing Assistance Fund because it's a lot of work. Just because a lot of work doesn't matter. It, it's important that we take care of our citizens. I'm told it's not too late. There's still plenty of time and money to apply. So until the money runs out, but there's still plenty of money, so please come by if you need assistance. No appointment needed. Jesse Degollado, KSET 12 News. San Antonio Animal Care Services says the number of dangerous and aggressive dog affidavits it gets has nearly tripled since a deadly mauling on the west side. 81-year-old Miguel Nahara was killed by a dog in February. Since then, ACS says the number of monthly affidavits has jumped from 21 to 58. The affidavits are needed to start the investigation that can lead to special restrictions for those dogs. Our dangerous dogs are 
out of control. We have so many dangerous dogs that we don't realize are dangerous dogs at the time, but we have to do a better job in more aggressively holding um, owners that are irresponsible with these pets more accountable. ACS removed three dogs today from a home on Hartford Avenue on the southeast side. Those dogs are believed to have sent a man to the hospital this weekend. ACS said if a judge decides that man's injuries are severe enough, the dogs won't simply be designated as dangerous. They'll be put down. Let's move to a developing story now. Some early risers, a scary moment this morning when a man began to allegedly shoot a gun at random. According to police, they got a call for gunfire on South New Braunfels, not far from 281, about four this morning. A family told KSAT they were in line waiting for food at a Whataburger when they saw a man, this man, carrying a gun in each hand. I was in the drive-thru just trying to order food for me and my family. There's a normal guy, thought he was normal, walking across the street over there and just started shooting. Just started shooting. Police don't believe anyone in particular was a target. They say the gunman seemed to be firing at random into the air and sidewalk after taking the gunman into custody. Police say he was told he was firing to scare people away. That's what he told them. At this time, it's not clear who exactly he met. Tonight, San Antonio police are looking for the person who shot two people in a stolen vehicle. This happened around 11 last night in the 2400 block of Castroville Road near Highway 90. Police say a man in his 20s was shot twice in the back and a male teenager was shot in the arm. The two drove to the 500 block of South Acme Road before calling for help. At last check, the man is in critical condition. So far, SAPD has not said where the stolen vehicle came from. They also don't have a description of the shooter. Gang ties in a deadly disagreement involving a man accused in a 2020 murder. Bobby Solis accused of fatally shooting John Eric Garcia at a West Side apartment. On the first day of his trial, it's revealed both men may have been involved with the Texas Mexican Mafia. Erica Hernandez takes us inside the courtroom. <laughs> Emotions were high inside the 399th District courtroom as 911 calls were played the night John Eric Garcia was killed. Garcia's girlfriend and aunt both called police. We're coming down here, at the time of the shooting, Solis and Garcia, according to the affidavit, had an ongoing feud. Witnesses saying that Garcia went to meet Solis in the parking lot of an apartment complex in the 1100 block of Callahan Road. Police were able to charge Solis after surveillance footage and cell phone records placed him at the scene. In court, photos of the crime scene and evidence collected were shown to the jury. Several shell casings were found and even one that went into a nearby apartment. As for the defense, they told jurors the two men were both alleged members of the Mexican Mafia and had been feuding. Solis not denying he was there, but saying he didn't shoot Garcia, but someone else who was with him did. It's still unclear if Solis will be taking the stand in his defense during the trial, but the trial will last most of the week. If found guilty, he is facing up to life in prison. At the Kathina Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. It is one of the oldest areas of San Antonio, and the people who live in neighborhoods west of downtown say they feel forgotten. Neighbors on the west side tell our Jonathan Cotto that their streets are falling apart and have been for years. And they're unsure if the city has taken notice. Estamos abandonados aquí por la ciudad. Alberto says he's lived in this neighborhood near Culebra and Zarzamora Road on the city's west side for over 15 years and says he feels this part of town is abandoned by the city. Mire, ahí en ese lado no hay banquetas, todo quebrado. Claudia Garza says that this is a colorful neighborhood with lots of good people and says they pay taxes. The very least the city can do is fix the streets. Pero si conforme a lo que pertenece a la ciudad, así como nosotros pagamos y ellos nos exigen, ¿verdad? Algo para atrás, mínimo, pues la, el pavimento. Juan Antonio Guajardo has lived in his home nearly 50 years and says he's seen better streets in Mexico. Nosotros procuramos tener un poco mejor limpio. Pero por más que limpiemos y todo, la calle está imposible. Ahí tiene usted los pozos esos. Usted lo puede ver ahí. ¿Cuánto tiempo tiene? 
The streets in this neighborhood just west of downtown are in bad shape. The streets are ridden with potholes. There are no sidewalks and the people who live here say they deserve better. First of all, they're right. You know, there are a lot of areas in, in District 1 that have been neglected for years, for if not decades. But Avo says initially the holdup was there weren't enough sidewalk repair crews and says those crews have increased since last year and they're hoping to double the budget for 2024 and says repairs are on the way. Well, I mean, it's on a street by street basis, so some people might get a, uh, their streets repaired next year. Some people might be two or three years away. Some of the areas of concern did fall into District 5. We reached out to Councilwoman Terry Castillo, who says through redistricting, we now cover some of these areas of concern. Fortunately, all scheduled street maintenance projects in the area are still on our infrastructure schedule. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. We also received a statement from District 1 candidate Sue Kaur, who is facing Mario Bravo in a runoff for that council seat. She said in part, quote, I intend to make infrastructure my first priority when elected and my first hire on council will be focused on infrastructure, end quote. You can read her full statement on our website at ksat.com. I want to tell you about something coming up tomorrow. KSAT and our community partners holding a mental health town hall. Lee Waldman will be talking with a panel of experts about challenges to accessing mental health care, especially for children transitioning into adulthood or aging out of foster care. You can submit your questions at ksatcommunity.com. Town Hall streams live on KSAT 12 starting at 2 p.m. tomorrow. It's actually streaming on ksat.com. Yes. Still ahead on the news at 6, the NBA draft lottery. It's tonight, and Spurs fans are hoping the silver and black get the top pick. After the break, see some of the super superstitions people are holding on to to try to make it happen. Coming up tonight on the night, we're going to talk about the flooding situation, the weather. We're also going to talk about pools. Warmer weather here, school's almost out. That means your kids will want to head to the pool. Are they ready to go swimming, though? Tonight, what every parent needs to know about swim safety before you head out. This and more tonight on the Night Beat at 10. It is NBA Lottery Night, and the hopes and prayers of Spurs fans are on the line. In less than an hour, <laughs> we will know if the Spurs landed the top overall pick in the draft, a player who many say is the next LeBron James. RJ Marquez tells us how Spurs fans are going all out to bring Victor Wembanyama to the Alamo City. San Antonio is known for their belief and for their faith. That faith is what Spurs fans are holding on to with the top pick in the NBA draft on the line. It's a San Antonio tradition for people to light candles or velas for good fortune or luck. The Spurs wasn't going to be the exception. So again, if with their faith and with their belief, they're able to help out their team, that's that's what they're here for. At Papa Jim's Botanica on the south side, candles are already lit with the hopes that the Spurs get the top pick, French star Victor Wembayama. When they're in the playoffs or when it's something important as um, what's taking them today, they definitely want to have their input. And if a little help or if a little candle helps, then yes, it's more than welcome for them. And it's not just these candles that will hopefully bring the Spurs good luck. Spurs fans are already manifesting Victor Wimbayama in silver and black, as we saw at a Southside favorite. Rudy Seafood is known for their Spurs murals and already have one of what they hope will be the Spurs future. Just kind of, we, we, we're kind of gambling on the fact that we're going to get the number one pick and he'll be with the Spurs. And see how it goes. Local artist Nick Soup created this Wimbayama mural. Owner Roland Ramirez is a big Spurs fan and said he hopes that he doesn't have to replace it anytime soon. Right now, that's what they're missing, that one piece. And I think he would fit in real good with the Spurs. And we found one fan out in the rain, hoping the heavens have opened up to bring the Frenchman to San Antonio. Let's go. Don't first go, man. Don't first go. All right, Stephen Meyer, we are live right now at the Rue Pub off of 281, where they are doing a very interesting promotion here. The owner has said that they will take care of everyone's tab inside the bar right now if the Spurs do land that number one pick tonight. So obviously, a lot of people here, a lot of excitement citywide for hopefully this franchise-changing prospect, Victor Wembayama. And guys, I do have the candle with me right here. So I'm going to have to go probably light it here in just a little bit and maybe say a prayer or two that the Spurs do get some good luck here in this upcoming NBA draft, which is going to be right after 7 o'clock tonight. So yeah, very exciting stuff here. Reporting live from the north side, 
RJ Marquez, case I told me. All right, all right, RJ, open up a tab, light that <laughs> candle, you're ready to go. Do what you gotta do. That too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, RJ. Let's take a look outside with live cam. A soggy evening and afternoon. It's good to see some more rain. I know it's piling up in some places though, Adam. Yeah, over two inches in parts of town, officially at the airport three hundredths of an inch. Yeah, it's Ooh. it's one of those situations yeah. right where yeah, it's just hit or miss downpours and we're looking southwest of San Antonio. San Antonio right here, of course. Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen County seen some showers and thunderstorms, some heavy activity down there. It's starting to taper off west of town along Highway 90 and even in the hill country. A lot of this is just that leftover lingering shower activity that should really come to an end after sunset. But some of this still has a little bit of weight to it, you know, the southwest of comfort here near Camp Verde, some moderate to heavy rain associated with those red colors on the screen. Kendall County, northern Kendall County. Now we've got the showers and storms. We're going to switch over our radar sites here, get a better, more higher, better, more accurate and high resolution look. This showers drifting eastward from Kendall County about to cross into Comal County. So shortly around well, just well, basically spring branch and right along 281 north of Spring Branch there near the Guadalupe River crossing and the bridge. You can expect that downpour. Of course, we have those campsites there and people obviously are often doing some recreational activities along the river there. Canyon Lake, it's coming to an end. Comal County, just some lingering rain left over that little light pitter patter, which is the good soaking rain. And where we had the issues on I-35 earlier today, we're starting, this is I-35 north of 410 and 1604 as well. And we're starting to see the rain slowly taper off where the activity is the heaviest is now. And by the way, the south side, you've seen the rain come to an end and it's not going to be redeveloping in the night. Gonzales County, even eastward to Hallettsville, Shiner, Moulton, seeing the heavy rainfall, lightning and thunder. Overall rainfall so far in this area, and keep in mind, it's still coming down. It's not done yet, it's still coming down, but the rainfall, whenever you see the yellow on this map, that's a minimum of two inches estimated by the Doppler radar. So let's just get right into Smiley and Nixon. And check this out, right along Highway 87, 2.2 inches Smiley, Nixon, 2.5 inches. So healthy accumulations over a short period of time from these showers. And again, after sunset, I anticipate most, if not all this activity to quickly start coming to an end at that point. All right, let's take a look at this. This is one of the issues that we had earlier today posted on KSAC Connect 35 in Walsham, and we still have some high water there, especially on that entrance ramp. And this look at this rain gauge. We're talking almost two and a half inches in less than an hour in one part of town and got to have the beautiful rain shafts. Those are good looking rain shafts that we had out there earlier today. Here's our aquifer. We've got the recharge zone, this narrow strip here of purple, and that's where we really want the rain right on top of the recharge zone, but also the contributing zone. It drains into the aquifer as well. So these are the main zones where we want the rain. We have them outlined here and look at the rainfall over the last seven days on oh, that beautiful thing of beauty. The aquifer just keeps rising. It's going to continue to respond to this rain. Right now it's 19 and a half feet below the May average, but we're gaining ground and that's nice. We have the extreme and exceptional drought, San Antonio into the hill country, even Hondo, but just isolating that area and looking at the seven day rainfall, really putting a dent in that drought. Thursday, the new drought monitor is coming in. It's not going to have all the rain from this week, but it will have that heavy rainfall from the weekend and anything up to early Tuesday morning. Right now we're at 69 degrees, dew point is 66, still some light rain out there around town, but it's really coming to an end south of Highway 90. By 10 o'clock, calm wind, most of the rain over with. We get to midnight, I even think some clearing in the sky. We'll start to see some stars around and after midnight, then partly cloudy tomorrow, a much quieter day. 10% chance of a shower, so an isolated rogue shower, but generally dry. 65 in the morning, 87 in the afternoon, Sabinal making it to 88, Canyon Lake 86, Gonzales a high of 85. And then sunny and dry, a little bit warmer, right near 90 for Thursday and Friday. But this weekend, a little shift in our pattern could give us some intermittent, widely separated showers and storms. We'll keep an eye on that and update you accordingly. All right, lots to watch once again. Thanks, Adam. Well, there's a saying to the victor go the spoils. Well, tonight <laughs> it's all about the victor. Yes, and all about Victor Wimbanyama. And I certainly hope 
RJ opens up a tab up there because we need <laughs> all to. the luck that we can get. Yeah, right? we're Come going up. there for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, RJ? We're coming, baby. Hey, so tonight is a Spurs uh, chance to see if they're going to land the seven foot two phenom Wimbiyama for sure. Plus, our Lady of the Lake track and field teams are getting ready for the Nationals. Coming up. What stood out to me is um, how like driven everyone is to get better on the team. An influx of freshmen is leading our Lady of the Lake track and field to new heights in big board sports. Ping pong balls will be bouncing around in Chicago tonight, and they'll determine the fate of the Spurs, Rockets, and the Pistons, who will have a 14% chance to land the number one overall draft pick in the June draft. Spurs managing partner Peter J. Holt is in the Windy City to represent the team. Now, the actual lottery procedure will take place in a separate room just before ESPN's national broadcast at 7. Select the media, NBA officials, and representatives of the participating teams and the accounting firm Ernst & Young will be in attendance for the drawings. Here are the Spurs draft draft lottery possibilities 14 percent to land the top pick and then it drops him there until the sixth pick where the Spurs really have the best chance at 26 percent. The WNBA is rescinding lead Las Vegas Aces 2025 draft pick and suspending head coach Becky Hammond for two games without pay the league announced today. The punishment comes after investigation by the league determined that the Aces violated league rules regarding impermissible player benefits and workplace policies. Plus former Aces player Derek Hamby alleged she was bullied and manipulated for being pregnant and that it led to her being traded to the LA Sparks. Hammond allegedly made negative comments to Hamby about her pregnancy. Philadelphia 76ers fired head coach Doc Rivers following a third straight exit in the second round of the playoffs. Rivers led the 76ers to their second straight 51 season behind NBA MVP Joel Embiid, but again failed to lead them to the Eastern Conference Finals or beyond. Miami Heat head coach Eric Spolstra was blown away by the news. Yeah, it's, it's disturbing. You know, Doc's a Hall of Famer. You know, you get past the first round, there's going to be some really good teams, great players, great organizations, great coaching staffs. They're going to lose just by the nature of this, this beast. I mean, there's only so many teams that can advance. Spolstra and his Heat advance to the face to Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals that begin tomorrow night in Boston. Our Lady of the Lake is home to one of the best track and field teams in the NAIA. The Saints are currently ranked sixth in the nation in the Outdoor Track Index, thanks in part to a young core of 28 freshmen and 51 total underclassmen on both the men's and women's teams that have made an instant impact. The men won the Red River Athletic Conference Championship, while the women finished as conference runners-up. Now they're looking to finish their season with a strong showing at Nationals next week. Well, I'm very excited. I'm excited to have more men on our team, too. I remember last year it was just us females going in a four by one. So I was very excited to not only go to nationals again, but also PR going into that. You know, our team has gotten bigger this year, so it's just very exciting. Coming up to college and having a team where, you know, it's not just competitive on the local conference level, we're competitive on the national level, looking to even possibly podium at nationals. That's a really amazing feeling because I know that all of us and the guys here put in a ton of hard work and just being able to see the fruits of our labor is something that I really, you just can't replace. The outdoor championships begin on May 24th at Indiana Westland, and we'll have more on the team tonight on the Night Beat. Including where the Spurs will be drafting. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if RJ got his tab. Fingers paid. crossed. Sorry, I'm yeah. holding a tab, but it's hard. If RJ Marquez gets it. <laughs> RJ Marquez, better deliver. Tab of Diet Coke paid for. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Our KSAP Q&A with Mayor Ron Nirenberg is next. There was a dangerous dog attack just this weekend in town. As a matter of fact, earlier in this newscast, we reported about some dogs being taken away as part of that investigation. And since the deadly dog attack earlier this year, there have been a number. It is triple with the number of dangerous dog reports that have been sent in to animal care services. Mayor Ron Nuremberg joins us now. And uh, yeah, I know that the city council's made some changes when it comes to dangerous dogs and how animal care services responds. Talk a little bit about those changes and if what how you are viewing some of these numbers that we're seeing. Sure. Well, there has been an increase in dangerous dog calls, I think largely because of the public awareness after the tragedy that occurred on the west side of San Antonio earlier this year. 
uh, it, the animal care services has shifted resources to really uh, start going after uh, you know, loose and roaming dogs that present a danger to the public. And so you're seeing that activity. I would say the greatest change, though, uh, there's a couple of pieces of legislation that will allow it, uh, us a uh, little bit more flexibility in investigating uh, and seizing dangerous animals after they have, uh, you know, bitten somebody. Um, but the other big change that's occurring is we actually now have a new strategic plan for animal care services. And so I'll be advocating along with a number of my colleagues for increased services that or, or increased resources to go ahead and execute that plan uh, in, in a couple of stages. One is to make sure that we do have more resources and officers out on the street to control the loose uh, animal population. Um, and you're already seeing those folks go through the pipeline. We're getting a head start through training new animal care officers. We're also working to ensure that there is, uh, we get back to um, lowering our euthanasia rates by having responsible pet ownership. So more spay and neuter resources, you're gonna see some of that on the agenda this week. Uh, but also, again, making sure that we have an appropriate uh, level of service that helps transfer uh, uh, strays that have been caught to places that might need more for adoption services. So there's a number of things that we're working on in animal care to keep the public safe and also make sure that we have a, a healthy uh, pet population in San Antonio. It sounds like there's an effort to really keep tabs on a stray animal population. You touched on this a little bit, but what about penalties for owners that are not following the rules? They, they may have dogs that are loose or aggressive. What about something that really makes sure that the owners are facing some sort of penalty for that? Yeah, and, and that's part, part of where we are looking forward to possibly having some of this legislation passed that's been uh, filed by our own Bear County delegation, but that is largely governed by state statute. Now, where it does help is when these reports are, are filed, we do an investigation, and in many cases, these animals are seized. In fact, that you saw that happen uh, this week already with a couple of dog bites that occurred. And when those animals are seized, if they're determined to be a danger to the public, they are euthanized. But uh, again, a lot of this has to uh, be meted out at the state level because pets are considered private property, uh, but we're getting a lot more flexibility and we're again, we're putting a lot more resources into ensuring that we are getting at this issue of loose and, ro loose and dangerous roaming animals and then following up on investigations that happen at the local level. I want to talk about something different that is happening at the state level, a so-called preemption bill, a piece of legislation that made its way through the Senate, approved there. So that would essentially ban cities from creating rules or regulations that preempt what exists at the state level. You've been outspoken against this, quoted as saying it's undemocratic in, in a lot of ways. What would that mean for San Antonio, for city leaders like yourself, if this gets the governor's signature? And, and, and sure, and let's be really clear. S local city laws do not preempt state law. And it's very clear when the city has a constitution that's voted on by the public, uh, and ours was established in 1952, that the state constitution allows for cities to create rules and regulations that their community wants in those areas that are not covered by the state. These pieces of legislation, which are called super preemption bills, are those that would say that wherever the state doesn't expressly say it's okay to govern, a city, a local community cannot, and therefore upends the intent and essentially the entire reading of a city charter disenfranchising local voters that have put this charter in place and have had it in place for you know 80 plus years so um, it's it's been a challenge to see some of this it's it's sort of the climax of an ongoing uh war that that the state uh, state government has had on local cities around texas for a number of years this is some of the most far-reaching legislation that we've ever, ever seen and the effects of that are a little bit unknown. The only thing we know for sure is that there's probably going to be a lot of litigation uh, that, that comes from local and state level throughout our state and, and Texas over the next several years if these things pass. But what we do know is it calls into question our ability to do things like uh, control for excessive noise, keep from 
you know, uh, large uh, vehicles from parking in front of your house. We wouldn't be able to do those sorts of things. Um, regulate predatory lending. There's a lot of things that, that local communities do through their city charters that would be now preempted, prevented, prohibited by this kind of state legislation. So, again, this is not uh, this is not at all what our state constitution intends. And uh, that's the message that we're trying to get to our legislators who have our ear on this. So basically, a lot of what decisions made for San Antonio will be made in Austin. Essentially, if you ever have an, a local issue you're trying to deal with under these pieces of legislation, you have to go and work work uh, your state legislators, and they only meet for 114 days every two years. So if you got a local issue, uh, you're, you're going to have to really endure that and see if you can get something past the state level. That's the reading generally of what they're trying to do up there is centralize all of this stuff, uh, local issues at the state level. All right, Mr. Mayor, I cannot let you go. I know you're a sports fan without talking about the draft lottery tonight. A lot on the line. The Spurs know they will draft no lower than seventh, but of course they could draft first. But we did a story earlier about people lighting candles, people doing, you know, crossing their fingers, various things. Will you be watching the draft lottery tonight? And do you have a superstition that you're going to carry out? No superstitions, but I, I will say we're, we're putting as much good energy out there into the universe for the Spurs as we possibly can. Uh, we know the Spurs have been a gift to sports, and I got to think that the, the sports gods will, will uh, look favorably upon the Spurs just for that tradition and history. I will say, though, I am wearing all silver and black today. In fact, a <laughs> silver and black tie that, that's from France because we know that the uh, object of everyone's desire in the NBA right now is is uh, sitting in uh, France. All right, whoa, 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 whoa. You said you have no superstitions, but you're wearing <laughs> silver and black and you have from a tie France. from France? It's, it's not a superstition, Steve. I'm just uh, I'm just doing what I can to support. Uh, I don't know. It seems a little superstitious you to me. You an office fan? I'm not superstitious, just a little stitious. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Ron Rurberg, appreciate your time. Go Spurs, go. Thank there you, you go. Absolutely. We'll be right back.